Thank you very much for accepting our invitation from Presenza and Imagination. And Suleiman and Hen, um, both they are co-founders of Combatants for Peace. And they were nominated to ICE for the Normal Peace Prize in 2017 and 2018. Both times the nomination was on behalf of Combatants for Peace. So I want to start immediately from here. Uh, you are co-founders of Combatants for Peace. Can you tell us what is it in a few words? And also if you can add also, um, what is it for you in your life uh, in these hard times? Thank you Lera, for uh, having us and good morning for everybody. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to have this conversation with you. And uh, uh, for your question, uh, uh, Combatants for Peace actually born uh, during the Second Intifada uh, out of um, conversations that held secretly around Bethlehem at the time between some of the Palestinians that were fighting or were in jail before, like myself, and uh, Israelis that also were in the army. And basically, in a very short cut, um, both groups differently has reached the conclusion that there is no military solution for our cause, for the conflict. And there is no either uh, us or them anymore for some of us. Um, as I said, like myself, I've been in jail for uh, more than 10 years, from the age of 14, like all my teenager time. So I've been in uh, in, um, in different uh, parts of uh, exploring what can work, actually. And for uh, some of us, and for us, I think uh, nonviolence will come around the values of nonviolence and dehumanizing the other side, and work together for uh, for a better future for our peoples, both Palestinians and Israelis. And since then, uh, like around 18 years ago, I'm talking about long time, I believe Combatants for Peace has contributed a lot to the grassroots movements locally and globally that shows the transformation and change is possible. And uh, turning what we call the other into a brother is, is possible. And this change is not exceptional for a few people, I uh, believe every uh, human is able to change and to, as uh, Nelson Mandela say, people don't hate by nature when they're born. They have to learn to hate and so that's also they can learn love and forgiveness as well. And Combatants for Peace has been uh, around for the last 18 years and the main identity, as I said, from the founders, ex-combatants from both sides, uh, working together and this is as far as I know one of the only models historically in an ongoing active conflict uh, that ex-fighters will join uh, hands to work for peace and uh, reconciliation, historical reconciliation for the liberation and the freedom of our peoples in both sides. Pen, you want to add something on this? Um, yeah, I mean, Suli was very accurate as always, uh, but I would like to highlight some of um, the mirror picture of uh, Suli said he was in jail for 10 years. I was uh, uh, more than 10 years in the army. I became a major in the Israeli army um, and I had the same urge as Suli to protect his people. I always thought that I'm protecting my people. I believe that violence and the arm um struggle resistance defense whoever you know what in any way you describe it that this is the solution and i realized that uh, violence was uh, is the problem and not the solution always um and i decided to refuse to serve the occupation and i was sentenced to jail for that um and only when I uh, realized that uh, we cannot release ourselves from the occupation as occupiers and, mm -hmm. and uh, release and liberate ourselves from uh, the apartheid system, which is the main oppression between the river and the sea, 
Uh, only then, when I realized that I cannot do this alone, that I need my Palestinian partners, and I found, uh, as an ex-combatant, as an ex-officer, I found the partners in uh, a group of people, courageous people in the Palestinian side, that abandoned the violence as a means of uh, liberation or means of resistance, of fighting. And um, we joined forces in order to bring an end to the occupation and the apartheid together and to develop a binational, nonviolent community, which after 18 years we are defining as a binational, nonviolent culture. We are developing an alternative to the reality as a community that people can join us and um, be part of this just um, and, and uh, equal system of power, even utopic power uh, in our community that is not ignoring the context of the op occupation of the apartheid, but providing an alternative reality for people who are resisting the violent and the violent circle and the uh, um, oppressive power structure. And um, I just would say that uh, nowadays, because it was part of your question, what is Combatants for Peace nowadays? Yes. For me, for me, and I know it's the same for Suli, because I've learned this term from Suli, we are steadfast. We mm -hmm. are rock in the reality that's steadfast. Uh, we are in the eye of a storm of crazy, uh, horrific violence, brutality, barbaric... Um, um, attacks that are going both sides, killing of innocent people and, and children. And we are embodying the vision. We are standing together in the reality within the eye of the storm to, to mark for people that we will be there after the war will end. And uh, we will be the, the seed that the next reality will be built around us as a binational, non-violent, peaceful, justice and human rights community. Thank you. Actually, the second question that I wanted to ask to you is about this transformation. You already were anticipating a little bit that there is like a life before combatants for peace and a life after, or uh, a life before um, the choice of nonviolence and a life after. So I, I like to say that I'm a, a, a story listener and I like story. So I wonder if there is a moment, an episode in your life that changed your point of view, uh, how it happens that you are, I don't know, um, a combatant and you are using violence um, and then you realize that violence is not the solution, as you said. Well, this is kind of the million uh, dollar question, million euro, million shekel, whatever uh, question, because um, we ask ourselves, because our movement was based on a personal story. Intuitively, we started the journey in Combatants for Peace um, on the basis or the principles of the Truth and Reconciliation Committees in South Africa, meaning when you are take, uh, telling your personal story through violence, you are taking responsibility on truth and reconciliation. It doesn't mean that you are, um, that someone has to forgive you, has to forgive you, or to accept the fact that you are asking for forgiveness and so on. No, not at all. This is an action of telling your personal story, of sharing your truth and your uh, sometimes witness, sometimes active role in reality as a, as a violent person, as a violent human being who dehumanized the other up to a degree that you were willing or in some cases of us actually kill, killing or killed uh, other human beings. Uh, so to be honest, there is not such a moment, one moment of revelation or epiphany that I can say, this is the moment that I've been transformed. But there are, I'm a theater uh, director and theater uh, creator and uh, theater activist and, act, and, 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 uh, and, and artist. So I read my story and I read these episodes that I went through 
uh, through a theatrical point of view, and I will explain. I mean, I, I have a few examples. Um, one of them is that uh, I was already an actor in the theater, and I played um, a role in a theater play called The Awaken Sing by Clifford Odette. It's what, uh, Odette's. It's an American play about the depression of 1929 and how I was playing the young guy of the family and all the family is devastated by the, um, by the depression, the economic depression. And I'm telling them in the end of the play, like the catharsis is that I'm saying, we don't have to deal with our problem. We have to change the system. The capitalist system of the US economy is the problem and we should change that. Um, and that will create the change. And the audience applauded to us, and it was, uh, you know, I was wearing a three-part uh, suit with a tie in the Bronx of the 30s or late 20s in the U.S., in, the, in New York. The, the audience were out of their minds how this young man is, revolutionary young man is offering a solution uh, to... Uh, a social problem, an economic problem, and political problem. And I took off my uniform and I got into my car and I drove 45 minutes to the Gaza Strip. The year was uh, 97, I believe, or 96. And uh, I took, I put on my uniform with my major rank on it and I was a commander of a checkpoint uh, stopping and blocking from families, Palestinian families, to cross this checkpoint. Um, and I said, you need a permit to go to hospital. You need a permit to... And I specifically remember a young couple with a baby who, who tried to cross this checkpoint. And so there I am on the same evening on, on the stage, a uh, revolutionary guy who believes in a, a systematic change of the system and calling for a revolution of the system to bring justice and, and equality. And an hour later, I'm playing another role with my uniform, an oppressor, a commander of a checkpoint who is not allowing uh, innocent people to cross. Mm -hmm. So this clash between these two characters inside me, uh, the way that I couldn't integrate these two roles, these two characters, was one of stops along the way that um, I didn't allow me to internalize. I said, you have to choose one of them. Either you're a citizen, an artist who's calling for a change and is willing to pay the price for it, or you are an officer in a military dictatorship controlling and ruling millions of people. You can't be both. And the price is to uh, being a traitor to your people, being, being uh, considered as a traitor, sitting in jail and, you know, and being uh, boycotted and banned by your own people. Um, and I have many other examples, if you want, later uh, for one, just one more example is that preventing from children to go to hospital later on, five years later, uh, in uh, the next to Bethlehem, and at the same time, taking care of my own daughter, my own baby in their kindergarten, you know, at the same moment, saying, yes. you know, you're not going to hospital, you, you children in the car not going to the hospital from Husan village to Bethlehem hospital. And at the same time, calling my mother to pick up my daughter from the kindergarten because my partner didn't uh, warrant, wasn't able to do that. So again, this theatrical concept of a character of roles in life, in real life, and not be able to integrate the human being that you are with other social roles that you're playing was, um, was, getting to a degree that it was too much for me and I refused and I was willing to pay any price that uh, um, uh, I had to in order to be committed to the role of a human being that is not oppressing other human beings. Thank you for sharing so personal stories. Uh, Suleiman, uh, can you tell us... Uh, also, if there are these moments in your life when there was a shift in your perspective. Yeah, as Ken mentioned, also, like, for me, this was a, and still a journey uh, and reaffirmation of the belief. Because I think um, 
uh, the transformation from, I believe, of uh, armed struggle and violence. And as, uh, as I said before, I was in jail. When I was 14, actually, I was drawn to, you know, the revolution idea, but for, it was the, the women also. And, you know, Che Guevara, the Kofiya, um, and uh, during jail time, when I was in jail, when I was 15, I joined a few times, actually. I joined other activist prisoners in a food hunger strike. And in these food hunger strikes, which stayed, uh, continued for like 17 days, sometimes 10 days, um, in order to improve, improve the daily life in jail, we always succeed, actually. Um, and that was my first practical experience uh, to answer the question, which is controversial until now, everywhere, is non-violence. Um, non-violence can work in front of a uh, oppressed system, in front of a strong like uh, system. And this is the experience for me. And this was part of my, my change. And of course, uh, uh, this can go on and on, like in a different reasons for a long time of uh, thinking, of reading also about, uh, you know, Mandela was in jail, would read uh, about uh, non-violent struggle in other parts of the world, you know, in India, uh, Martin Luther King and others, but also like in our own culture, I would say, even from spiritual, religious context in our part, which is, uh, there is a lot there about also the non-violence principle, the smooth culture. I come from a very local Palestinian family um, that practiced over hundreds of hundreds of years that lived, they lived around Jerusalem, uh, what we call a smooth, which is steadfast. And this is connected to the olive trees. So for me, actually, when we talk about um, changing to non-violence, it's not just a theory of change or a, um, ideology or a, a intellectual conversation. It mm. goes much deeper to the heart and to the soul. Um, and I believe is important, and this is how I am, to really be truth and fully with ourselves, not just the intellectual part, which is important. Mm. Um, and also, of course, in jail, I, you know, I can tell you one thing that affected me by base, that I come from a family which practiced something called sulha, reconciliation. And in this old Middle East, Mediterranean culture, with the tribal reconciliation process, um, there is always two sides of the story, or more than two sides, which I believe is the next question about the narratives. And it's important. I come from uh, the typical classic Palestinian family, very connected uh, narrative, I mean, very connected to the Palestinian cause, to the Palestinian suffering, to the Palestinian struggle, to the longing for freedom. I didn't maybe put these uh, ideas in words when I was little, when I was a teenager, but now when I look back, I think part of also, as I said, coming from family that bring sides together in a tribal system, I think um, this kind of big part of my mission in life also is to bridge the differences. Um, mm -hmm. So I was very curious and also open to also read the Israeli slash Jewish narrative with challenges, you know, like if I reckon, if I open myself a little more, is that means I will give have to give up my own narrative. If I show empathy to the suffering of Jewish people, let's say in the Holocaust or before or after, is that will take my own uh, the justice of my cause as Palestinian or my own uh, being. And I, through the time, I come to a place where I feel these terms, feelings are not conflicted. I am able to carry in my heart the legitimacy of both people to be here with all the pain and the trauma and the collective trauma. I am able, and we are, as Ken also mentioned, we are able, like Ken used the, the other day, like a really beautiful term, um, that he said, I have a binational heart. And that's mm. where we are right now, like over these years, with the personal connections, with the openness. It's not because we are naive and we are doing nothing. That's really, mm. and unfortunately, uh, and here I finish my answer, because this we can dig and dig a lot. 
uh, the question of violence versus non-violence is a historical question uh, everywhere. It's not uh, uh, exceptional for our cause. Uh, and I believe um, there is the voice of violence, unfortunately, is much louder. But I really believe the majority of the population, um, they just want to live uh, for their survival needs and for their souls, not to hate and kill each other. Yeah. Thank you, Suleiman. Yes. So I caught some expression that you are using that I like a lot. For example, Khen before said embodying the vision. And then Suleiman, you are saying fully with ourselves, not just in ideology. Mm. And this expression that I like a lot, by national heart. So my question is um, about your path in nonviolence. And um, as you said, Suleiman, that is not naive. Um, on the contrary, uh, it takes courage, uh, a lot of courage. And Hen and you were saying about the risks to to this of this choice so yeah my question is a bit um, open now and it's about uh, your instruments or practices um in combatants for peace to to allow this to allow uh, a binational heart emerging and to also to um, cultivate this courage and what are the risks for example, Khan was saying also to, to be in jail for Israelis, but uh, I'm interested also to uh, to know risks for Israeli, what are the, for the Israeli and what are for um, Palestinians. And so in Combatants for Peace, um, how you build trust and create healing, reconciliation, uh, Khan was saying we start from personal stories, uh, and also I'm interested about your communication to, um, let's say, the other people outside Combatants for Peace, um, how you reach them, how you reach people that are uh, in another, let's say, narrative of the things. I will start with a binational heart because it's... Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where it came out for, from, from my heart after 18 years. We ne I never, um, it's, an, it's a new invention of an image, uh, which is, uh, I'm asking a lot myself why it happened to me recently in this, uh, in the war, in this uh, um, a recent war, current war. Um, and I think that we're one of the lowest point of, uh, of uh, aggressiveness and brutality and killings and dehumanization. Um, and I realized that it wasn't like this at the beginning. I was joining Combatants for Peace or I was co-founding Combatants for Peace as a very protected Israeli Jew. Uh, protected, I mean, protecting my own identity as Suli was referring to other people suffer, other people pain. I was uh, focusing and I was very possessive about my history, my pain, uh, the Holocaust, the suffering, uh, uh, the exile, the refuge, my people. I think that um, already, I don't know if it's an emotional or empathic or spiritual training that we're doing in Combatants for Peace, mm -hmm. but after 18 years, I can say that... Uh, the children of the South and the children in Gaza are breaking my heart in the same way when they are being uh, killed or kidnapped or tortured. So I have the same place now in my heart for, for children, for example. That, that's easy because I have children, so it's easy for me. I feel that it's easy. But it wasn't this, this way years ago. And I think that when I'm saying training, it's not only training of empathy or of uh, it's um, I think it's the, the way that we are training ourselves in, in action, that we are committed to both 
practices and bro both lanes, both paths of combatants for peace. One is the constant dialogue, reconciliation, rehumanization. For, for example, one of the practices is the Israeli-Palestinian memorial ceremony that we've started 18 years ago with dozens of people in fringe theater in Tel Aviv. And the last few five, four or five ceremonies that we do, the annual uh, Israeli-Palestinian ceremony are comprised of 15,000 people in uh, a park in Tel Aviv and 200,000 people online that are needing this uh, joint sorrow, agony, pain to feel together. Um, and it's not only, as you said, it's not only an Israeli-Palestinian need, it's, a, it's an international need. It's a human need from, that we are witnessing from all over the world. So that's one commitment that is allowing us to develop this uh, empathy muscle that we are uh, um, training ourselves. But the other is that dialogue, reconciliation, coexistence, and so on is not enough when there is a systematic brutal, strong uh, system of power relations that is oppressive. And this is the occupation and the apartheid. So the other commitment, the other journey, the other path, the other lane that we are developing beside the reconciliation and the uh, rehumanization is the nonviolent struggle, the resistance, the actual confrontation of the oppressive system. And this in various ways, like direct actions, uh, demonstrations, image theater, uh, forum theater, um, um, rallies, marching, um, various ways of steadfasting in front of the oppression together. Israelis and Palestinians are um, 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 having same mo same movement, same action, same activity in front of the occupation. And I think the intertwining of these two paths is something that is uh, uh, exception, exceptional and unique to this mm. binational uh, movement that allows the committed human beings in the movement to have, after years and years, a binational heart and, by the way, a binational mind. Beautiful. Thank you. Suleiman, you want to add something on this? Yeah, first I agree with uh, everything Ken said. And uh, within uh, Combatants for Peace and in the wider circle of activist groups, uh, there are many tools. Uh, you mentioned the storytelling uh, mm. tool. We use a lot of other uh, strategies and tools in order to open up for... Uh, a new world, a new narrative to emerge, to be born, uh, not stuck in the old story. And that's not easy because it's uh, people are traumatized and uh, easier to stuck in the old narrative of victimhood because there is a lot of uh, sorrow and, and uh, suffering right now and generally. Uh, and maybe just to mention, uh, the fact we holding uh, the Memorial Day ceremony, which uh, can go directed for many years, uh, to humanize the other side is really beyond imagination, actually. Uh, to be together in sorrow and in, in, uh, in solidarity. Also the Nakba ceremony, which is uh, started like almost five years ago in partnership between our Palestinian and Israeli uh, uh, partners um this is to touch uh, um, a traumatic event for palestinian and to look, uh, recognize the pain that uh, the catastrophic events of 48 has caused uh, to the palestinian and it's a lot of education a lot of uh, openness and also like that doesn't we didn't shy away from touching a harsh uh, topics to talk about uh, really to to enter a hard conversations uh, and also the trust building and uh, also like all kind of uh, uh, nonviolent actions on the ground um, uh, to show there is another way. And actually this is um, 
I would say important because of specifically um, like allowing imagination of people that this place can be different. We don't have to be enemies forever to fight forever. And as a model to attract people uh, to this, in our eyes, heroic actions, because people by the culture are attracted to the heroic uh, arm actions. And we try to create this model for people, for young people, especially, um, that there is some place they could put their energy. Yeah, now I have this image. Um, you said before about the seed, the seed after the war. And um, yeah, I, I see this seed um, that is about this, uh, em to, to develop this empathy muscle or to yeah empower this empathy muscle but at the same time at the same time to struggle against an oppressive system it's like this seed can sprout uh no in a polluted uh, field uh, this is the image that i have now and i wanted to share with you so now i have a challenging question um I want to say that um, in the first weeks of the war, I had this idea, crazy idea maybe, uh, to write a letter to the soldier, to the Israeli soldiers. And then um, maybe I didn't have courage enough or maybe hope enough to do it. Um, so um, now I have this challenging invitation for you. And uh, the invitation is to imagine that Han, you can talk with a Palestinian child in Gaza now. And Suleiman, you could talk with an Israeli child from one of the kibbutz that was attacked on 7th October. And I invite you also to take a moment of silence, to imagine that there are premises that allow these children to listen to you with a, an open heart, an open mind, and yeah, and let the words emerge. And when you are, when you feel to talk with this uh, child, please do it. I have to say, before I start, um, I need a disclaimer, and I know that it's a manifestation of oppression that I'm, I'm suffering from, because um, <clears throat> this is really challenging, because I work a lot with hopeless people, as I mentioned, with theater, and one of the first features or manifestation of oppression is that uh, people cannot imagine another reality. People cannot imagine a utopian encounter such as you uh, are offering us. Mm -hmm. And I realize that it's part of the oppression, that I cannot imagine this. It's difficult for me um, because I cannot imagine myself facing now a, a, a Palestinian child in Gaza. I cannot imagine a Palestinian child in Gaza that will listen to a, mm. an, an adult guy, man, ex mm. soldier, ex officer in the Israeli army. So my first um, imagination went to two places. And it's interesting because, first of all, I wanted to ask you that you will allow me to bring Suli with me to, yeah. to meet this yeah. Palestinian child. Yeah, like, sure. Uh, I need Suli for that encounter. Yeah. And the other thought that I had was that um, I won't say anything to this child. I will, I will tell him that my first responsibility and obligation is to listen to him. Mm. At what, to ask him what he wants to say to me. Um, so that's my first two thoughts that came to my mind and I realized that are blocking me from imagining mm. this uh, 
conversation, these uh, words that I would like to, uh, to say to this child. But maybe after Suli will speak, I will have uh, more um, power from Suli to uh, get over this block and this uh, obstacle. And I will, will able to, to talk to this imagined child. Yeah, thank you, Ham, to be so um, authentic. And it's, yeah, it's very meaningful what you said. Thank you. Suleiman? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, when you ask the question, I'm, I went inside my heart to be able to see a child or kids, uh, Israeli kids. Especially I felt um, um, like I had a lot of feelings. I can share mm. openly like uh, uh, yeah, I, I feel like my heart is really heavy. Mm. Uh, also guilt that part of our people would kidnap a child. Like this is, makes me feel dirty. Like uh, morally, I feel uh, triggered. Yeah. Um, and also I feel deep, warm empathy to these kids that just born there. They have no uh, responsibility in which family in which side of the world they born and i'm aware these kids are carrying also their uh, family's trauma mm -hmm. uh, and when i feel this i feel my savior part of my heart but part of me is like moving like want to save want to protect and want to to tell all these kids um, that they are protected, that they are safe, and they are loved. And I feel sorry also for them that we adults couldn't prevent uh, what happened in October 7, after October 7, before October 7, um, for all the kids, the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, and I feel, uh, as I said, like really a lot of emotions. Mm. Uh, and also a lot of uh, responsibility, I feel, mm. uh, to keep doing what we do and more uh, to change the historical discourse. Uh, and I'm in this mission, I fully believe like of a very uh, promising uh, times to come for these kids uh, and i i feel these kids uh, has been uh, used uh, for something they didn't create and this makes me wonder like one is to really condemn the action of kidnapping kids, arresting kids, attacking kids, killing kids. And I really don't know which God, like as a, I come from a Muslim family, Abrahamic family, like which demonization we are on to be able to do that. Like it must mm -hmm. be a harsh uh, place. Um, and I, as I said, I feel my moral value system is really triggered and uh, uh, activated. A lot of senses in me are activated. Just the imagination that I'm talking to Israeli child uh, that was in the uh, massacre of um, October 7. Uh, and I, similar to him, actually, I have also some similarities. I really, when I hear the news and when they speak about kids that were kidnapped, 
to, to Gaza, I'm not able to have any imagination. I can't, to be honest, to imagine, because I'm not able to give any explanation to that to myself, to my conscience. So I really call our mothers and our uh, their prayers and our uh, the land we claim to belong to and the God, any God, and the values and all the people that have conscious really to connect with their higher conscious and to build this new conscious that really can see and feel, provide protection for all of these kids and see them as equal from the day they born. And yeah, I feel sorry, like, yeah, I feel sorry and I feel more uh, urgent uh, to work more so that this, this is not gonna happen again, hopefully. And that's why I don't want to talk uh, intellectual in my mind and mm -hmm. be, uh, connected because I try to stay my heart open to the reality, connected to the reality and trying to keep some a balance with the dream that this place can be really um a, i really think like this place can be a model for a global freedom because i believe people are not free anywhere anyway to say in different levels um, but this we can talk about it like another thing thank you suleiman i need to say i i i can feel your heart thank you so you understand, Ilaria, why I said I will bring Suli with me, right? Because yeah. I would say to the Palestinian child exactly and accurately mm. what Suli says. Uh, mm. Israeli boy, I would say to the Palestinian child, saying sorry mm. uh, and saying that I failed. I mean, I will acknowledge that we failed our responsibility. I failed my responsibility that these children in Gaza, that you, the child of Gaza, had to go through. And the only thing I would ask him, this child, is uh, not to give up hope. It's the only responsibility that uh, I would ask him. I mean, he has, he has no responsibility of what he went through in this horror and nightmare and hell in Gaza, but the only thing I would ask him, offer him, invite him uh, to fulfill his responsibility, not to give ho up hope, and that one day we'll be able to join Suli and I to this, uh, to the journey of hope, and and I would I will uh, advise him that this journey, this way, this path, is um, is not is not with the M16, not with a weapon. Mm -hmm. You can walk this journey with, of hope with weapon. And I will ask him to forgive me. Maybe I add uh, one sentence to what Khen said and uh, now fill my heart yeah. a bit. Uh, after we, what we both said, I also, I want to invite everyone that's listening to us now uh, to give a moment of silence and breathe with open heart and to to let the empathy part each person in the world has empathy but sometimes we limited this empathy to our beloved ones in order not to challenge our narratives and our mind that our mind try to control i really want to use this opportunity to into practice to invite everyone no matter which political side they stand no matter including the people that support war now and support violence to give our second to their heart to their soul if they could really what they feel when they feel when they remember and see these kids whether in south israel or in gaza and kids that have no guilt of what's happening now and to give a chance for the empathy and for the humanity including during wartime this is the generosity of moral and morality that i know it really exists in all our all our cultures and this is really can be a turning point 
for a personal transformation and for a collective transformation as we, we spoke before about transformation and that's mm -hmm. why the movie that steve abkin did the brilliant steve abkin called disturbing the beast because we many of us think we live in beast but it's actually not really beast it's the order the system that built on separation on injustices on a historical colonization from different sides on uh, people taking over uh, other people on a feeling that there is not enough there is, but but from our experience want to say there is really abundance of resources of love and materialistic resources um, and everything that we can have a different life and a different world is fully possible i'm seeing this i'm seeing this in the middle of the tragedies that's happening right now in gaza and in south israel and in many places here also in west bank side israel nobody feeling safe and it's a very happy moment but i can feel and see uh, the opportunity to really turn this page for a historical moment to really let it go a little bit of the old story to to allow a new story to to bear to exist where our people can really be fully themselves and true and uh, and and then be and safe thank you shukran toda beautiful to be with you with this really heart wide open yeah um jona messi uh, she she says um walk courageously through life with a broken open heart i felt in these words exactly this sentence we are going to to finish but i want to ask you if you feel to add something uh maybe related to what is going on what it's related to the so called uh, deals if you have something to say about this or whatever you feel that you want to share that it's important for you i would like to add one more thing that you've asked about and i didn't um, i feel that i didn't uh, uh, relate to and it's uh, i believe you and most of the viewers or the people who are listening to us that so called the international community mm -hmm. uh, like if people are listening to suli and, and i and are thinking to themselves oh these barbarics in the middle east or this israeli palestinian conflict or whatever and they feel that they are detached or far away or what or if they are uh, honest and thinking what can i do what is my role and so on and i again want to return to the um to the theatrical um, um medium or the theatrical um, sphere that is uh, teaching me a lot about my role on stage of the conflict and uh, suli's role as the protagonist or the antagonist in this uh, conflict and you the people who are watching and listening to us that think that the role of the spectator is is just to observe and to remain passive mm -hmm. and uh, i think theater uh, the theater that we are doing is teaching us that there is no role without responsibility that we all should uh, transform ourselves in the world from viewers from spectators from observers into uh, the role of a spectator that we all have to fulfill our responsibility and to become um actors in the dramatic moment that is requiring us or demanding or asking us to become active and the one thing i want to say to you is yes activate yourself join us become an actor in on the stage of the israeli palestinian partner a uh, conflict but don't think that your role is to either be pro israeli or pro palestinian it's not the story mm -hmm. it's not the play mm -hmm. the play is that you have to be 
uh, pro-justice, pro-equality, um, pro-solidarity. And if you want to run the same risks as Che Guevara was referring to solidarity, it means that you have to ask where is the arena, where is the stage that people are co-resisting, co-existing, struggling together, rehumanizing each other and so on. Enjoy these stages and don't remain a spectator who says I'm pro-Israeli, I'm pro-Palestinian. Polarization is increasing and is feeding on one side Islamophobia and on the other side anti-Semitism. So thank you so much. I'm uh, adding my voice to my brother and friend and ally Chen. Uh, and also, uh, so I want to say one for um, also our people here in the land, in this sacred land. Uh, I feel like fully really in my heart and I don't live in La La Land, like I live fully in the um, um, in the land here where we feel and see and uh, witness and uh, experience firsthand the anger, the violence, the occupation. Yeah, I come here to Bethlehem to stay with my friend. I have to go through checkpoint. You don't know if you will go, will go back or not. The danger, um, the polarization also, as you said, and I feel actually it's very connected with the global movements right now and always, but right now I feel the division among the anti-Israeli movement, if you want, or pro-Palestinian movements and the pro-Israeli movements. And uh, actually I have to say, one, we used to say here for Palestinian and Israelis, we live in different movies, even now. In reality, and on social media, like I, because uh, I know Hebrew from jail time, if I watch uh, the news from bo from all sides, it's a fully different story to say, mm -hmm. because there is really a battle around the superiority of the morality. No mm -hmm. one wants to feel or admit that their morality is less than the other to keep the dehumanization. Uh, and I experienced this because I, I have friends also and Palestinian, my family and my friends. I also have Israeli friends and partners, activists. So, and that's part of the, that where we are right now for the international also with my respect. Um, I'm happy for the awakening movement that I feel, I see globally. It's beautiful, really. I don't agree with every slogan happening there, including the uh, and specifically, the one that carry a lot of hatred in my name, and I don't want this to be in my name. Uh, mm -hmm. My vibration, my, our people's vibration from um, from the apartheid, from the occupation, from violence, from ideologies of hatred, from all the darkness that here, it doesn't include harming other people, especially civilians and kids. It doesn't include hatred for any group of people. And we see that some people around the world, politicians especially, companies, weapon companies, industry, and others want us to fight forever for the last child, since we spoke about kids also, for the last Palestinian and Israeli kids. And I wish there is a awakening moment for our people to be aware that we as neighbors, we have to live next to each other in whatever arrangement. So in that sense, as combatants for peace, I would say, and personally, we do support any agreements, including the one for now, you know, for the prisoner uh, hostages exchange, for the sea, uh, ceasefires. But I know this is not enough, mm. it's enough for now, uh, mm. and there is intention of the war leaders, of war, uh, to continue to eliminate the other side and this commitment. And we call these people also for to feel the life. Where is the life? Like, where is mm. we want to fight for life and justice? We do know that we need a deeper political, historical solution than the arrangements of ceasefire now. But this is 
could be a good beginning for uh, the fighting sites to come down from the tree, as we say, and to start opening up uh, for like a real, for other options than bullet army option. Um, so yeah, I'm personally continue to stay in touch with the reality and also optimistic of of um, of, of a different uh, reality for the vision. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really. Yes. Yeah.